Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Our top story, ad inserts, AI-generated cartoons, and anti-American views circulating on Facebook and X. A roundup of how Beijing looks to shape public opinion in the West. Will the U.S. increase tariffs on China? Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says it's a possibility. More about her concerns on China's overcapacity. And this includes the issue of China's industrial overcapacity, which the United States and other countries are concerned can cause global spillovers. A controversial trend inside China's real estate industry, home buyers purchasing apartments not to live in but to store those who have passed on. As neighbors complain about units filled with cremation urns, experts shed light on what's behind the widespread phenomenon. As a rare East Coast earthquake rattles New York, the death toll climbed from the powerful earthquake in Taiwan. We have the latest. Before we turn to today's top story, we'd like to share an announcement. We have a special report coming up this Saturday on how the United States helped communist China grow strong enough to take on the West. Here's a sneak peek. From less than 1 percent of the world's gross domestic product to a massive 19 percent, that's the marker of China's development in just three decades. How did the communist country grow so fast, and who helped it along? Never in history has one country funded the rise of its enemy, which is what the United States has done. It's an existential threat where the Chinese Communist Party is seeking to essentially destroy the United States, who they believe is the one country that can stand in their way of achieving this great rejuvenation of China. Across the board, you can pick a topic and you can see the pernicious influence of the Chinese Communist Party. And we're in this Cold War situation, this period of intense security competition that we must now resolve. Tune in this Saturday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time to learn more. Beijing's information war against the U.S. getting more sophisticated with the help of artificial intelligence. Take a look at this clip. It's an AI-generated animation spreading on Facebook and X. Inflation has heavily squeezed workers' incomes, but the rich are still cashing in, and the wealth gap widens. Ever seen a badge crack? Well, that's Uncle Sam's rep. These days... This video clip comes from CGTN. It's an overseas arm of Beijing's mouthpiece, China Central Television. CGTN has a U.S. branch and has been pushing anti-American views for some time. But with AI, generating Chinese propaganda has become faster and easier. A Friday report from Microsoft says China has been increasingly using AI-generated content in recent months to sow division in the U.S. What's more, similar Chinese influence operations are also active on U.S. soil. One of them is a Facebook community page called The War of Somethings. It pushes Chinese Communist Party talking points, videos, and articles that seek to paint the U.S. as a democracy in crisis. Take this post on the 2024 election, for example. The caption reads, quote, The campaign has turned everyone into a clown. Another Chinese influence operation also tried to persuade Americans not to vote in the 2022 midterm elections. Zooming out, the Chinese Communist Party spends big money to sway U.S. public opinion. It has burned over $300 million in this regard since 2016. That's only part of the budget. Beijing spends billions of dollars every year on its global campaign to push propaganda and shape public opinion about the Communist Party. When you look at the pieces of the puzzle and you put it together, you see a breathtaking ambition uh, on the part of the PRC to seek information dominance in key regions of the world. In the U.S., some of these influence efforts can be subtle, like this ad insert published on USA Today. At a glance, it looks like a news article that paints a positive image of Chinese leader Xi Jinping saying Xi's visit to an American school left an indelible mark on students. But look closer. You'll see a small line reading paid advertisement at the top. The ad was paid by China Daily, a Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece. And it's not just USA Today. China put similar ad inserts in some of the most influential American outlets, like Foreign Policy, Time Magazine, and the Los Angeles Times. 
China Daily also put similar ads in regional newspapers across the U.S., including the Seattle Times, the Houston Chronicle, the Boston Globe, and the Chicago Tribune. Senator Marco Rubio and Chuck Grassley wrote letters to these outlets in March, demanding they stop accepting money from China Daily. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in China. She wants Chinese manufacturers to change their trade model, saying they're producing too much of everything and it's a problem for the whole world. Biden administration officials have suggested raising tariffs on Chinese imports to level the playing field for trade. Former President Trump has threatened to impose 60 percent tariffs if he makes a return to the White House. NTD's Jack Bradley has more on Yellen's visit. And this includes the issue of China's industrial overcapacity, which the United States and other countries are concerned can cause global spillovers. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in Guangzhou. Guangzhou is China's largest industry hub in the South. Now, she's going to be talking to Chinese economic officials about China's overly excessive exports on Chinese goods related to energy, now, those including electric vehicles, batteries, um, solar panels, and other products of that sort. Now, China's able to produce these products excessively because for years the Chinese regime has been subsidizing these products. Combine that with a low demand at home, China's able to produce these products and sell them in the global market at very low prices. That puts it at, at a huge advantage. Now, Yellen has said that she wouldn't rule out the possibility of increasing tariffs on China. Here she is yesterday in Alaska uh, on a refueling stop on our way to China. We want to continue and we think we both benefit from trade and investment, but that it needs to be in a level playing field. Over the past few years, the Biden administration has been able to rake in tens of billions of dollars on tariffs on Chinese goods. Now, these tariffs were implemented in 2018 under the Trump administration and left untouched. Now, earlier I spoke with Stephen Mosher, the president of Population Research Institute and the author of The Devil and Communist China. Now, he told me while Yellen is on this trip, she should implement uh, harsher trade uh, tactics on China and uh, force it to change its business practices. Take a look. I think the tariffs should actually be increased to match the level of the subsidies that the Chinese Communist Party is providing industry. They are very dependent on their export base now because the domestic sector of the economy is quite plank, frankly floundering. They need the export se sector. Now is the time to put pressure on them. Yellen will hold a series of meetings with top Chinese economic officials over the weekend, and there are signs that China will not respond in kind. According to the state-run media outlet, uh, the Global Times, uh, China said that these overcapacity claims are a smear campaign. We'll keep you updated as these talks unfold. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. To discuss more about Secretary Yellen's China visit and the recent trips there made by American CEOs last week, we sat down with Rex Lee, security advisor at MySmart Privacy. Rex Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thank you for having me on the show, Tiffany. Now, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in China. How successful do you see her trip being? Well, hopefully it's very successful, and she is addressing uh, some really key issues. One of the number one e issues that she's uh, addressing is electric vehicles and solar panels. Uh, as you know, just coincidentally, uh, we had discussed a couple of weeks ago product dumping by China in uh, Mexico. We saw a slew of U.S. CEOs visiting China, with Xi Jinping telling them that China's growth prospects remains bright. Now, this trip came despite a bunch of tensions between the two countries and also warnings from the FBI and also the Biden administration. Why do you think the CEOs still went despite all the warnings? I don't think that uh, Western businesses really understand um, that how China is competing, or they don't really understand what we've talked about many times before, which is hybrid warfare, uh, which is warfare without rules, where everyone is a target. I've stated before many times uh, that uh, Chinese China's uh, weapon of mass destruction is not necessarily a nuclear weapon as much as it, it is the U.S. dollar, and we're seeing them use uh, money as their weapon of mass destruction, not only in the United States, but globally uh, through uh, their uh, trade uh, deals that they have with the West and around the world, which 
really puts them in a favored position to compete against uh, United States and Western companies more effectively. And on that note, what kind of leverage does China have over the tech that is sold inside China? Tim Cook recently uh, visited uh, uh, China uh, ahead of the CEOs. Uh, and he went to China uh, mainly for the purpose of getting Apple sales back up in China. They declined to 24 uh, percent. And a lot of that had to do with a directive from uh, China uh, that uh, government agencies and uh, mainly multinational corporations within China were to de basically decouple themselves from uh, Western technology, including Apple products. It's not only just Apple products they were targeting, they're trying to decouple their critical infrastructure from their reliance on Western technologies. And this is done through a, a program called the Delete A uh, program or Delete America program. Uh, so Tim Cook had went over there and he's trying to get Apple sales back up, but He's looking at uh, more competition, not only in China, but around the world from Huawei. So now you see that sanctions against Huawei have been laxed uh, ever since the Biden administration uh, has taken over. And you're starting to see Huawei uh, infrastructure cells go back up as well as their smartphone cells go back up as a result of this. And part of it has to do with lobbying efforts, mainly here in the United States, uh, Huawei's uh, chief lobbyist is Tony Podesta. So now Apple's starting to face not only competition in China and the fact that their technology is, is on that list to be deleted from uh, uh, government official use and corporations, they can still target consumers, but they're facing much different competition from Huawei. How safe is the U.S. power grid? Electrical networks are becoming more susceptible to cyber attacks, according to a regulator. Wars and the upcoming presidential election adding to the pressure. The weak box in the U.S. grids grew almost 10 percent last year compared to the year before, with about 60 more per day. According to the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the war in Gaza have dramatically increased the number of cyber threats to the U.S. grid. Plus, a great number of threats are coming from China. The regulator also expects the likelihood of grid attacks to rise as the 2024 presidential election gets closer. A bizarre phenomenon reported inside China. Residents are complaining about their new neighbors, but not for noise complaints or cleanliness. Instead, apartments are getting bought up to use for an unusual kind of memorial to store cremation urns. Reports of this are popping up across China. Some residents say the behavior severely violates Chinese taboos and has driven them to move away. Why choose a residential apartment over a grave? China experts weighing in. Windows covered with blackout curtains, posters were even bricked up. Residents are pointing to an unexpected new trend appearing across China. Residential apartments being bought up and turned into so-called memorial houses, meaning residential housing bought specifically to transform into a memorial and final resting place for the remains of a loved one. Thursday marked China's Qingming Festival, also known as Tomb Sweeping Day. The festival is a major holiday for Chinese people, serving as a time to remember family members who've passed away. But in recent years, some Chinese residents have started visiting apartments instead of graveyards to mark the holiday. In China, there has always been a traditional custom known as let those who've died rest in peace in the ground. However, due to the bad economy and declining incomes, many people can no longer afford expensive burial plots and the high maintenance fees associated with them. Li is a current affairs commentator. According to Chinese media reports, the trend has become especially common in suburban areas surrounding metropolitan cities in recent years. But the fast-growing group is taking heavy criticism. In one apartment building that appears to have a memorial house inside, multiple neighbors hung red banners from their own balconies announcing that they've put their properties up for sale and plan to move. In other residential compounds, memorial houses even significantly outnumber living residents. That's as the price of burial plots rises and the cost of residential apartment falls. 
There's also another factor. Under the Chinese Communist Party, citizens cannot buy land. Instead, they must get permission to use the land from authorities, which expires after a set amount of time. Purchasing a home grants the owner the right to use the land the home is on for 70 years, whereas a burial ground plot is only good for 20 years. The trend basically emerged after 2020. The time frame coincided with the outbreak of the pandemic. So during that time, how many people actually died in mainland China? Did the significant increase in deaths lead to higher cemetery prices? Is there a correlation? I think this is worth questioning. Based on local reports collected by NTD, illness-related deaths are still running high inside China, impacting a wide range of age groups. Getting seen at hospitals requires waiting in line for around seven hours. The local authorities don't allow people to announce deaths publicly. All mourning has to be done at home, and then the remains must be taken to the crematorium. Many memorial altars are set up at home. I hear about at least eight cases every day through local chat groups. At the crematorium, there's a waiting list with cremations booked three days in advance. Six of my close friends have passed away. They were all diagnosed with either cerebral or myocardial infarctions. Very frightening. The youngest was around 28 years old, and the oldest was in their 60s. My best friend was around 40 years old. We used to chat together often, but after going to bed one night, the next day they were gone. The Chinese Communist Party has a history of covering up death tolls and infection numbers, both during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. We'll keep you updated as the situation develops. As Americans on the East Coast felt the shake from a magnitude 4.8 earthquake on Friday, across the Pacific, rescuers have discovered two more bodies in Taiwan, bringing the total death toll to 12 after Wednesday's 7.4 magnitude quake. Rescuers are still looking for about a dozen people still missing. They include a family of five feared trapped in a rock slide in Taroko National Park. It's a tourist attraction in Hualien. This morning, the Hualien County Government Search and Rescue Center reported that two people were missing, a man and a woman, and three foreigners were missing, one Canadian and two Singaporeans holding Australian passports. A total of 13 people have been missing so far. Drone footage shows the devastation inside the National Park. Rescuers face the threat of further landslides as they search for the missing. And in the urban areas of Hualien, authorities have begun demolishing a severely damaged building. The city government is in contact with residents to arrange for them to retrieve valuables from the building during or after demolition. The mayor of Hualien City said that reconstruction will rely on charitable donations. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for three years. Some viewers have asked about why we've been demonetized. We reached out to YouTube several times but never got an answer. Beyond demonetization, we've also gotten reports from viewers that YouTube unsubscribed them from our channel without their consent. Now, if you'd like to support us, consider donating. Find us at donorbox.org slash China dash in dash focus or subscribe to our partner platform Epic TV where you can watch our full episodes. Just click the link down below. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Taiwan's chip making giant facing delays in manufacturing. Its operations now slowly coming back online. What are the risks for the U.S.? More on the aftermath of the earthquake that rocked Taiwan earlier this week. It's important to get the um Uh, to get the diversification so that there's uh, a lot less more resiliency towards uh, some uh, supply chain shocks mm. like the earthquake. As Beijing and Washington compete for Pacific influence, Fiji says it's removing Chinese police officers over security concerns. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you soon.